Good morning. If you are here in person, stand with us as we begin to sing. Wake up a little bit. in the seat backs in front of you that have the QR code. 
And so again, it's to let us know that you're here, but it's also to communicate any needs that you have. If you have upcoming surgeries or tests, or you have concerns um, or questions, that you can get in touch with the office and with the staff. So make sure that you check in and we would appreciate that. Um, this morning is, I guess I know last Sunday was the new year, but this feels like really the new year is underway. And it's a big um, milestone for us because we now have a new full-time worship and media arts pastor. So we're excited to have him us. And um, so he visited a month or two ago, and so some of you might have been here on that Sunday, and we're privileged to hear him. So he will be taking a much larger role. You'll hear less and less from me on the platform. Um, and so we're thrilled to have him. It's great to have someone on the keys. Um, and to lead us, and he's young and has fresh experience and knows all the technology things too, so we are so thankful for him. Hopefully, hopefully I know all the technology. <laughs> I'm not quite sure yet, but we'll see. Um, but so, make sure that you greet him um, after service, welcome him, um, and go ahead and keep proving to him what a great um, congregation and a group of people we are and how welcome we are. So, <laughs> as we continue to worship, I know I just said to sit down, but why don't you stand back up as we continue to sing our praise.
And as you notice, we still have our Christmas stuff up because today is Epiphany Sunday. If you're not familiar with the Christian calendar and the Christian church calendar, uh, you may not be familiar with the word Epiphany. Epiphany uh, Sunday is, is when we celebrate and remember the shepherds coming to the manger and visiting Jesus. And so we uh, always keep the, the, the Christmas decorations up. We keep the Christ candle and, and the Advent wreath up and going. And, and to remind us and to be able to celebrate, it's still Christmas. It lingers. It doesn't just get put back in a box and forgotten. And so today, I, I thought, this is why I was planning this year's calendar for, for services and sermons and all that. There was a part of me that wanted to start last week with communion. Because it's the first Sunday. But as I prayed about it more and more and more, what better time to have communion? Than on Epiphany Sunday, when we remember the wise men, the Magi, coming to visit Jesus. And now it, it allows Christmas to linger further. And the babe that was in the manger that they came to celebrate became the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. So we have forgiveness of sin. That was the whole mission, that was the whole reason for the baby. And so this morning we're going to have communion as part of our Epiphany celebration. And as we do this today, I want you to remember the baby in the manger that came so that he could minister to us and so that he could share the gospel of, of love and his new commandment that we should love one another and that it should linger forever in our lives. And as we take communion this morning, I just want you to know you don't have to be a member here to receive communion. You simply need to profess Christ as your Savior. And also, as, as, as we serve communion, we're going to ask you to come forward and, and take a, a, a piece of bread and a cup and, and return back to your seats, and we'll all take them together. But if you're unable to come forward, I simply want you just to raise your hand, and then after everybody has, has gone through the lines, we'll come and we'll serve you. Uh, because we want to make sure everybody who wants to receive communion receives communion this morning. So I've asked... Uh, Reverend Father, Father-in-law, Doctor, Pastor Winston Hackett to help me this morning. I love having him on staff with me, by the way. Uh, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And so he's going to serve on this side, and I will serve this side. We simply want you to come and receive the body and the blood of Christ this morning. As you wish, please come.
sins in the body of Christ, broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, your sin. Passover meal was served, Jesus and his disciples met in the upper room. Jesus washed their feet when, he, when they came in, signifying the service that he would want them to also exemplify to the rest of the world. And then they sat down and they began having the Passover meal. The time of the meal when they passed bread, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he looked at his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is his body. The body of a baby born in a manger, sent by God for you. Take and eat. When it came time of the meal, when the cup of the, new, of the covenant would be passed, Jesus picked up the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood which will be shed for forgiveness of your sin, for all the world's sin. This is the blood. It represents the blood of the baby that was born in a manger, sent by God. So that he would die on a cross so that we could have forgiveness of sin. So that we could have restoration of a relationship with God the Father. He told them, take and drink, so take and drink. Heavenly Father, today, as we think of the shepherds who came to the manger, Gentiles that came from far away, following a star that they, that they were drawn to, today, Father, we, we celebrate that the baby that was born in the manger was not just for the Jews, but was for Gentiles for me and for, for all of us in the world. For the forgiveness of our sin. For a way to have restored relationship with God the Father. God sent Jesus, His Son. Scripture tells us that anyone who believes in Jesus should not perish but have an everlasting life because He came into the world not to condemn the world but to save the world. Today, Father, we celebrate. We've been saved by a baby in a manger who died on a cross for us. It was your plan all along. And Father, today we thank you for your plan because you loved us so much. You would die for us. You would wipe out our sin and you would restore the relationship with us. Father, we thank you for that today. We love you, Holy Father. It's in your Son's name, the baby that was born on a manger, was crucified on a cross, and was raised from the dead. It's in his name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I've also learned this part of this service. It's, uh, if you've not been with us before, when we brought on new staff, uh, this may be an unfamiliar moment for you, for those of us that have been here as staff have come and we have been sent out. Today is a special day, as Kim noted. Uh, I've kind of themed this year, New Year, New Staff, uh, because today we're, we're installing a new worship pastor. Next week we'll get to install a new youth pastor, by the way, um, and, and we're diligently looking so we may install a new children's pastor soon. That's my prayer of faith and hope in the future. But today I'd like to, to ask Josiah Gardner to come and just simply stand here at the altar for just a second. And I want to, uh, want to give you this towel as a, as a symbol. As I mentioned during communion, Jesus and his disciples gathered in the upper room. And in, in John we read that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. The person who washed the disciples' feet or washed anybody's feet as they came into their house was one of the lowest people on the, on the realm, on the run of all the servants. Their feet were dirty. Their feet were 
were smelling. It was a little nasty job. It's not one that somebody would put on the resume. <laughs> it, it's not a job that someone would ask for a reference for. Uh, it, was, it was one of those jobs. But Jesus reminded his disciples by action of doing it and then by words of saying, go and do as I have taught you and as I have done for you. That as, a, as one who's called to ministry, we are called to serve first, above all things. We are to serve all those around us and even seek and find those not around us that we can serve as well. And so today I want to gift you this towel. It's clean now. I hope it gets dirty, symbolically. I hope that over time, as, as, you, as you move into your position, as this all becomes new and real and becomes more for you, that, that you take on first the servant's heart, to serve those on your team, to serve those in our church, to serve those in our community, and to serve those in our world. Because that's what he calls us to do when he calls us to ministry. I would like, uh, I would like to pray for you if I can. I'd like you just to kneel here at the altar, and I'd like to invite those on the board and on uh, the ministry and the work, or minister, on the <laughs> worship and uh, media team to come, those that are available. We just want to lay hands upon him, and we just want to anoint him this morning. Rob, if you would, could you bring the uh, anointing oil that's up there? I think it's on the corner of the booth. I knew I forgot something this morning. Thank you, sir. Know that this has not been a uh, quick process, as you know. Uh, Kim has been serving so well as our interim worship pastor and has been doing a phenomenal job as we have been seeking God's will and direction as we find exactly who God has for us in this process. Uh, I'm moved methodically by the Spirit on purpose so that we can have just the right person for the right time for us as people. And so today, Josiah Gardner, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I install you as our pastor of worship and media. Father, today we thank you for your love and your grace that you give to us. We thank you for a calling on a life, Father, and a gifting and an empowering and an encouraging, Father. And I pray that, Father, that you would just fill Josiah today with your Holy Spirit as you have every day of his life. And that, Father, you would give him a special anointing as he leads us to your throne of grace, as he leads us to worship you, as he leads us as a congregation to lift your name and make you famous. And Father, I pray that you would help him, Father, to open eyes and see ways of serving all around him. Opportunities that you give that, that we may be givers of your good news, of your grace, of your peace, and of your love that you brought into the world that we can only have through you. And today, Father, I pray that as we commission him and as we install him, Father, that that, Father, you would just gift him even more. Lead him by your spirit. And allow him, Father, to not be uh, timid, to not be, uh, to, to cower, but to be bold and to be encouraged to follow you. And, Father, when there are days when it feels like uh, he, you're out in the wilderness wandering, allow him to just trust by faith that, Father, you are leading and he is following. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your love and your grace and your calling upon Josiah's life and for your leading him to our congregation. We look forward to great days of great times of great worship for you so that you may be glorified. And Father, we pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Josiah, I want you to stand up for a second. I want you to look around. This, these are, these are our board and your team and they're here for you. They're here to support you. You'll support him, right? So, yeah, yeah. And look around. This is a great church of great people. And if you'll support him and love him, will you just simply clap and say, we're glad you're here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josiah. You are officially installed, and we look so forward to all that God is going to do in you and through you for us and for his kingdom's sake. Well, before I jump into the sermon, uh, a few things I need to do. One is let you know that, as I alluded to and even said outwardly, uh, we have a new youth pastor. 
He will be starting with us on Wednesday. Some of you know him, some of you have seen him. His name is Chris Jackson. You can troll him on Facebook. Uh, welcome him. Be kind to him. He's a great guy. I'm uh, looking forward to some great things. And our teams are looking forward to great things. Our teams yesterday were at our district top Nazarene talent, TNT as we call it. And they took second place in the uh, overall team competition. And they did a great job. And uh, I even hear one of them did 34 different categories of TNT. Uh, somebody is what I would call a overachiever. James Gift. Um, <laughs> we are so glad that all of them had such a great time. And I'm so appreciative uh, to Amber Ott and to all the youth staff that went and watched over them and took care of them and transported them and, okay, put up with them sometimes. And, uh, you know, they just had a great time. They had lots of fun. And I'm so proud of our, our youth ministry. I don't know if you were here Wednesday night, but Wednesday night I was just awestruck. Uh, as you know, we run a van into town and we pick up uh, kids and, and students. We bring them in and we had to run the van twice this last week because we couldn't put them all on one. And I, I, was, I, was, I was wandering around because it was Josiah's first Wednesday, and so I, I wanted to be up here to make sure everything was going good here, and that, that that kid was being nice to him, and, you know, she could be mean, as Rob says, and, uh, and so I was just wanting to make sure that, you know, they got off on the right foot. Uh, Rob, I'm sorry if you get in trouble for that later. Um, but I, I, I came up, and, and everything was going great as I knew it would be. I had great faith in them. And I went back to the gym, and there's this huge circle of children playing in chairs in the gym, playing a, a game, and they were having a blast. And then they had a big birthday party, because they didn't get to have a birthday party for Jesus. And they had cake and ice cream, and they just had a blast. It was awesome. And there were, I think there were 18 children here on Wednesday night, and there were 20-some teens here Wednesday night, having fun, learning about Jesus, getting to know each other better. And it was just a great evening. There was a lot of activity. And if you're not here on Wednesday nights, you probably ought to be. We, we serve a meal at 6, and we have team ministry and youth ministry and worship team practices. We have a prayer group that meets and a men's ministry Bible study in, in the book of uh, the letters of Paul and a ladies Bible study that's going through discerning how, how to hear the voice of God, discerning the voice of God book and video series. And, and, and there's just something for everybody. And you just need to be a part of it. And I hope that you put it on your calendar to be here on Wednesday evenings because some exciting, good discipleship stuff is happening right here on Wednesday nights. Also, uh, as, as our teens are in the process of, of going to Nazarene Youth Conference this summer, there's a fundraiser that's happening uh, out in the lobby. If you want to be a part of that, you can. Or if you just want to simply write a check, it costs about $2,000 per teen to go to this activity, this event. So uh, it's a week-long, great time of worship and discipleship and ministry and missions and all kinds of great stuff goes on. Uh, and, and it's a life-changing thing. It's a totally life-changing thing. Um, if you want to just help out with that, you can write a check and put it in the offering box and just write in the corner, uh, NYC. And that doesn't mean New York City, it means Nazarene Youth Conference. And so the, your, your funds will go directly to help fund students to do that. And so we want to make sure you do that. And the last announcement that I have, uh, we are starting a Celebrate Recovery ministry. We've been in process of this for quite some time. And today we're having what we're calling a learner's lunch. If you have questions about what is Celebrate Recovery, what does it do, what, is it, what do you mean by that, what does it look like, How does it, what happens at a Celebrate Recovery meeting? Uh, after church, we're going to meet in the gym, and we've got some tables set up, and we're going to eat some food, because I know food will attract you, and it's good lasagna, I picked it out, so if you don't like it, blame me. Uh, and there's some really good brownies, and some, somebody even made us a cobbler. I'm not saying that was one anymore, but I'm not saying it's not, so it's really good. Uh, and, and so uh, there's just some great stuff. If you want to be a part of that, we are just, we're, we're, we're in the process. It's not starting next week, but we're going to have a meeting today so that we can begin the process of planning the, the, the launch date and all that's going to happen with it because our community needs a lot of recovery support. Um, I know if you look around, if you read the news or if you watch it on TV, uh, recovery is a huge thing that's necessary and needed in a lot of areas in our community. And so we want to do what we can to help serve our community as best we can. You remember last week, if you were here, we were talking in first, uh, the, the first chapter of Philippians, and uh, we, really, we only covered two verses. Uh, the second verse was the verse I really kind of focused on. It said, uh, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you what? Grace and peace. 
May, may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And our challenge was to be grace and peace people. You know what grace and peace people look like? Uh, let me tell you what they look like. This last week, I received three cards in my office. This first one is just all over the place. Thank you, 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 thank you. This second one, sincere thanks with a great note of thank you so much for all that you did to bless my family for Christmas. This, this last one. Thank you so much for your kindness. All, all, all of these are, are grace and peace that we gave. I want to read this first one a little bit of it to you. If I go to the first one, not the second. Here we go. Hello. And then she says her name. And my kids were part of your Share the Joy program due to my family experiencing money issues. Words cannot begin to describe how much I appreciate the gifts your church family provided for myself and my kids. Christmas was very enjoyable thanks to your kind hearts. Thank you for your blessings. Just can't thank you enough. That's grace and peace. That's you being grace and peace people to people that you may never know. Some you may know uh, within Share the Joy or Operation Give It Away that we've done this last year. But many of our folks, we have no idea who they are. And I believe that's how God calls us. That's what Paul's talking about here in Philippians. That we should be people of, of grace and peace. As God has given us grace and peace, we should be people of grace and peace. So I just want to say thank you for being grace and peace people before you're even asked to be grace and peace people. Now, uh, many of you know me quite a bit. By the way, I didn't say this last week, and, and somebody told me I should have, and I didn't want to be the guy to say it, but did you know that last Sunday was the first Sunday of my 14th year here? I've completed 13 years as your pastor. Uh, for, honestly, I just got to say I'm surprised you kept me more than one year. But I just want to say thank you uh, for the way you have intersected my life and the way that you have engulfed my family with love and, and encouraged me as a pastor and just really been a great body of Christ that, that follows the, the leading of the Spirit as, as we move into the future. And so I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. And I just love how, uh, how God is using all of us to be grace and peace people in the midst of the world. If you know me, I'm, I, I'm, I'm what I call a realist. I'm not a pessimist. Uh, uh, but, but the reality is, most of us started out as a, as a zero in life. When, when you're born, when you were first born, uh, you have potential. You're a bundle of potential, but, but, but honestly, you started out as a zero. Now, now some of us may, might have had a little bit of a head start based on our family or different things, uh, but, but we're pretty much all zeros. Now, I'm not a nihilist. Uh, a nihilist is somebody who, uh, who believes that all these traditional values and beliefs are useless and that all existence is meaningless and useless. Uh, and a nihilist would say all is nothing. And we may have started out as zeros in our life. The whole world, the, all the creation started out as zero, as nothing. But God, our Creator, cast nothing into nothing and created everything. God cast nothing into the expanse of the blankness and created the universe. Put a sun in the middle of our, of our galaxy and, and put nine planets in a merry-go-round kind of formation around it. Those, those nine planets have been, have been rotating around, revolving around the, the, the sun ever since the beginning of existence and they've yet to collide. Put uh, white, fluffy, fleece like clouds in the sky, and grass and trees on the ground, and water all over the earth. He created all this out of nothing. And I believe that if, uh, if God, who creates ex nihilo, ex nihilo means out of nothing, if a God who could create things out of nothing in the, in, in the, in the world, he can create something out of us as well. I believe we have a God 
who can create something out of nothing. And I believe we can do the same thing with our lives. I believe in the, in the, in the uh, messiness and the, the misery and the, and the craziness of, our, of maybe our marriage or our finances or our relationships or our habits or our addictions or, or whatever in the world that we bring to Him. He can create something out of that that is good. Last week we talked about may God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. And I thought it'd just be great for us as the second Sunday uh, of, the, of the new year to just continue in that realm. So if you have scripture with you, turn to Philippians chapter 1. I want to hear more of what Paul has to say for us today. Now last week I took it easy on you. I only read two verses, verse 1 and 2, and I think we covered that well. So uh, I think you need some remedial work. So we're going to cover verses 3 through, through, through 27. So uh, hang with me, okay? Uh, we're going to read from the, the New Living Translation, but to be honest with you, uh, there are some things that we're going to talk about that are found better in the New International Version, the NIV version of the Scripture. And so you're going to have some crossover happen. Uh, let me read it for you. Paul says, every time I think of you, he's talking to this church in Philippi, uh, these folks that are 700 miles away that have sent an offering for him while he is in prison, this offering is so that he can have food and, and be taken care of, uh, because in a Roman prison, they give you nothing. They hope that you die, so they don't have to do anything with you. And Paul says, again, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for, you, for, for all of you with joy. For you have, been, you have been partners in spreading the good news about Christ from, from the time you first heard it. Until now. And I am certain that, that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I, I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you, and I long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand that what really matters, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you also be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. And I want you to know, my, my brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It is true that some are preaching out of, out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do, do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. And, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me, and the, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that, that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I, I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. 
But for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he has done and doing through me. Above all. Or, or as it says in the New International Version, whatever happens, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Father, today we read your word and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the message of Paul to a church in Philippi, a, a church that he's writing to while he is in prison and wanting to give them an encouraging word of faith. I pray today, Father, that as we break open your word, you would give us an encouraging word of faith. A word of faith that will challenge us and, and propel us into this next year, that, that we will be your followers, that we will be those who have received grace and peace, so now we must go and give grace and peace, no matter what happens. And today, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for challenging us and speaking into our lives. Allow my words to be your words today, Father. Allow my heart to be your heart, my mind to be your mind. Guide and direct as we go. Speak as only you do. We love you. In your son's name. Amen. So Paul is living this, uh, this existence, this life of, of whatever happens. We love to be in control, don't we? Don't you, don't you hate it when you're, when you're driving your car and you hit ice and you begin to slide? You're, you know you've got a feeling in your stomach that, ooh, oh no. That when, when, when you're turning and your car's not, and you're like, ah, and your brain and your, and your body and, and deep in your stomach, you're like, oh no, this isn't going to be good. You're out of control. Paul's out of control. He doesn't have control of, of what's happening in his life, but he's allowed whatever's happening in his life to not affect his faith. Even though he may not be in control of, of what happens to him day to day, he knows that there's one who's in control of the grand scheme of life. Now, in verse 12, Paul, Paul tells us that, that what has happened to me has 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 happened so that we can advance the gospel. He knows that as, as, as the guards have come every day to check on him or to bring him food or, or sometimes he, he, the palace folks, they, they've heard about him and so sometimes he gets ushered out and taken to them and they kind of question him. But every time that he is, he's taken out, he uses that as an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God, to witness to live out his faith, and, and, and even though he has no idea what his destiny at that moment, his earthly destiny is going to be, he knows regardless what his ultimate destiny will be. So he goes without fear. He goes without any, 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 any kind of timidness. He goes boldly. And many of the guards, as they've come in contact with him and have, have talked with him and as he has built a relationship with him, as he says in Philippians here, they've They've come to know Jesus. Even the, the, the folks that work in the palace, the, the, the gospel that he's been spreading and sending has spread all the way to them in the palace. And, and there are many who are serving in the, in the Roman palace who have become Christian and are following Jesus. See, Paul took a prison and turned it into his pulpit. You see what he did? He took his prison and he turned it into a pulpit. Now, now this isn't new to, to us. It shouldn't be so new to us because if, if, you, if you look at Paul and Silas 10 years prior to this writing, they were in a prison. And, and, and the scripture tells us that as they were in prison, they, they were singing and praying. And, and about midnight, the jailhouse rocked. I stole that from Elvis, by the way. Uh, the jailhouse rocked. And, 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 and they were saved. They were set free. What didn't stop there? 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote The Cost of Discipleship, one of the greatest discipleship books you could read. If you have not read it, make it a part of your list to read this year. It will change your life. Okay? The Cost of Discipleship. I don't know what the cost of the book is, but I know the cost of discipleship is a lot more. Okay? Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that while he's in prison in Germany. John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, a great book uh, of, of, the, of the discipleship, of the process of being a disciple of Jesus, of being a pilgrim who was following Jesus in his life. He wrote that while he was in a prison. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote one of his great letters that, uh, of freedom, of declaration, of, of proclamation of Christ. He wrote that while he was in a, in a jail in Birmingham, Alabama. William Augustus Jones, uh, when he was thinking about uh, Daniel in the lion's den, I love this quote, he said, Daniel was not in the lion's den. The lions were in Daniel's den. God wants to take your prison and make it pull up. The prison of your sin, the prison of your circumstance, the prison of your disability, the prison of whatever, your, your insecurities, your, your prison of whatever happens in life, he wants to make that into your pulpit so that you can pro proclaim his message so that the kingdom of God can advance. When we let him, when we let him, God uses our prisons as pulpits. We just installed a new worship pastor, and uh, I get to stand here every Sunday and preach. And, 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 and some people feel like that's what pastors do. We have pulpits. Everybody who follows Jesus has a pulpit that you should preach from. You should proclaim the message of Jesus. Proclaim the message of new life. Proclaim the message of forgiveness and restoration. You have a pulpit. Don't let it be a prison. In, uh, in verse 19, Paul says, uh, Look, I, I know that I will continue with your help and, and, and with your prayers and with the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The word help there, significant. Uh, that word in the Greek is the word that we take in English and make the word choreography. Choreography. You know what a choreographer does, right? Uh, they, 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 they set the stage. They, 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 they make the plan. They're the ones who direct the dance. And what Paul is saying is, the Holy Spirit is my choreographer. Uh, as I follow the plan of the Holy Spirit in my life, he's able to take my prison and make it into a pulpit. He's able to take my circumstance and make it into something special. The Spirit of God is Paul's choreographer. Uh, in Paul's point of view, he's, he's allowing the Holy Spirit to, choreograph, to be the choreographer of his circumstances, even in prison. Paul's not in prison accidentally. He, he's not in, in prison coincidentally. He's not even there incidentally. He's there providentially. Because the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's using him. And Paul knows this, and he sees, hey, hey God can take this, this, this misery, this, this, this terribleness, this, this wasteland, this, this thing meant for death, this hellhole that I'm living in, called prison, and turn it into a way to advance his kingdom. If you've read the book of Romans, you know that Paul had a... Uh, had a famous verse that we use all the time in the book of Romans. And, and it was easy for him to, to write this verse when he wasn't in a Roman prison. But when he's sitting in the Roman prison, he's now living out the, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. See, see, Paul knows that it, God's working in the midst of his prison, in the midst of his circumstance, for his good. For the good of God's will, the good of God's kingdom, for the good of, of God's eternity. When Paul wrote that, he wasn't in Rome. But now that he is in a Roman prison, he's living that. And what a great message to those that, that see him in there who have read maybe those words. Wait. 
This is the man who said that, that God's going to work in the midst of all of his circumstances to bring good because, because he loves him. And he's called according to God's purpose. And we're seeing it happen as, as the guards and palace servants and the other inmates are being impacted by Paul's message of the gospel. Now, those who know me know that I love cake. I love cake. I love eating a good cake. Uh, my mother could make some of the best cakes ever. Uh, by the way, uh, you may not know this, but there's a guy in here who makes the best chocolate cake I've ever eaten. Jackie Harrington. He puts, like, cherry pie filling, grounds it up, and puts it in, and you would never know the cherry. It is so moist and so good. That is one of the best cakes you'll ever eat. I love cake. But you know what I won't do? You won't find me sitting in my living room eating table food, tablespoons of salt and tablespoons of vanilla extract and, and raw eggs. But you put those things all together and, and, you, and you put them in an oven and you bake them and you bring them out and you put frosting on them. God takes all these good things of our life and works them together for his kingdom's sake. See, he wants to take the ingredients of your misery. The, the, the ingredients of your, of your failed relationships or your failed finances or, or, or sometimes we need to look back and we hate to say, but even our failed life. And he wants to use all those to make a sweet creation and a purpose out of your life. He wants to use your life as a pulpit. Paul says, uh, things, are, th things are going to work out Things are going to work out for my deliverance, whether that means here on earth or, or, or in heaven, whether I've got to stay with you or whether I'm going to uh, go. God's going to work this all out. In the NIV, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What he's, what he's saying is, look, I, I entrust my life to the, to, to the God of the universe, the creator of all that there is, the one who made everything out of nothing. I give my life to him because I know that, if, that if, he, if he allows me to live, his message is going to be glorified. And, 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 if, and, if, and if I die because of these circumstances, his name is going to be glorified. If you read, uh, if you read the book of Job, the book of Job is an interesting book. The first two chapters of the book of Job God allows Satan, allows the devil to begin uh, messing with Job. And, 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 and you hear the voice of God in the midst of this, uh, giving protection over Job in the midst of allowing the devil to mess with him. But I don't know if you've studied the book of Job. Because from, from chapter 3 to chapter 37, God is silent. Job is being persecuted. Everything that, that Job has is, is being taken away from him. His, his family and his friends are all telling him, curse God and forget him. But Job stays faithful because he knows that chapter 38 is coming. He knows he has faith in the God that he loves and that he serves. The one who spoke in the first two chapters of the book and spoke early and often in his life before this situation. How long can you wait for God to speak into your life, into the circumstances and situations of your life? Some of you are, or maybe in chapter 30, in your marriage. And you're waiting for seven more chapters for God to speak. Maybe some of you are, are, are in chapter 12 in your finances. And you're waiting for a long time for, for God to speak. Some of you may be uh, in, in chapter 20 with your addiction or your sin or your habit. How long will you wait for the voice of God to speak in your life? 
Will, will, you, will you allow your, your, the prison that you're sitting in and all of this to become a pulpit for you so that because you know of the God that you have faith in and trust in and that you live for and that saved you and that restored you? Will you continue to wait? So let's have several more chapters before God is going to, uh, to take us to the place that he wants to take us. But will you, will you stay faithful Continue to listen to the sign of God in your life at the moment. Finally, in, uh, in verse 27, I love verse 27. This is the hinge point. This is, this is the point I really want you to get today. Finally, Paul says, look, whatever happens, whether I live or whether I die, whatever happens, here's what you're to do. Conduct your lives. Conduct your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens. Whatever happens, whether you live or die, whether, whether you hear the voice of God in the midst of your prison or, or, or you don't, whether, whether you, you're, you've been waiting for a long time for, for your son or daughter to come back to Christ, whether you're waiting forever for, for your spouse to come to Christ, oh, whatever that situation is, whatever happens in the midst of whatever, we are to live our lives in a manner, such a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. He's saying it doesn't matter whatever happens, whether, whether I stay or not, whether I live or I die, live a life that honors God. Are you honoring God with your life today? Are you honoring God with every part of your life today? You see, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish theologian, so, so pointedly said, life is lived forward and understood backwards. Life is lived moving forward, but, but sometimes we have to look back to see the big picture of how things fit together. We can't get mired down by the circumstance. We have to move into the future, trusting that he's guiding and directing us and leading us. He's the choreographer of all that's happening in our life. I think Paul could do this because he knew that this is exactly what Jesus did. Earlier, as we were... Uh, talking about communion. Paul's looking back. And he says, remember, Jesus was the one that was, was in the upper room with his disciples and he washed their feet and, and after washing their feet and they, 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 they ate the Passover meal and he transformed the meal into the Lord's Supper and, and then they left the house. They, they went toward Gethsemane singing songs, hymns. And they got to Gethsemane and Jesus is there with, 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 with Peter, James, and John, and he, he says, stay here and pray while I go over there and pray. And, and Jesus goes over there, and, and he begins praying, and he says, Father, if there's any way, let this, let this cup be removed from me. Take this cup from me. No, I, I, I know what you're calling me toward, but I don't know if I can endure that. I don't know if I can handle that. Can, can, you, can, can you take that away from me? He goes back, and his disciples are sleeping. He wakes up and goes, come on, guys, pray with me. He comes back and he prays again, Father, if there's any way, let this, let this cup pass from me, please. He goes back to his disciples and again, wake up, guys, pray, please. He comes back and he prays a third time, Lord, hey, God, if there's, if there's any way, take this cup from me. But his prayer changed then. Not my will be done, but your will be done. The prison of your life right now, whatever prison you may be in. Are you willing to say, not my will be done, but your will be done? And Paul knew that, that, that from that moment Jesus was then arrested. And he was he was he was taken and he was he was beaten and he was put on mock trials and, and he was put on a cross and, and while he's on the cross, uh, it, it took three hours for, for for Jesus to get to the point of my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To into your hands I commit my spirit. 
Sometimes when we're in that desert land, when we're in the, the, those middle chapters of Job in our life, when we're, when we're in that prison, when we're, when we're kind of surrounded by our circumstances and we, we're not hearing the voice of God, maybe we need to be able to allow ourselves to move from, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To the simple acknowledgement of, into, my, into your hands, I, I commit my spirit, God. I'm going to allow you to be the, the choreographer of my life. I'm going to allow you to have your will and your way with everything in my life. After Jesus was crucified and he was buried, there were a dark three days. That Friday was a, was a dark, bad day for the disciples and for all followers of Jesus. Saturday was completely silent. And, and some of them were scattered and were in fear. And they locked themselves in rooms and didn't want to be the next one on the cross. But thank God, Sunday came. And on Sunday, uh, the body was no longer in the grave. It had risen from the dead. And Jesus came back in power. Sunday's coming. Your Sunday's on the way. It, it may be silent right now. It may be a time of the desert. It may be dry time, but Sunday's coming. The choreographer is creating a dance. He's creating a stage. He's creating a performance that's beyond what you could ever think of for you. And for the 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus did ministry upon the earth. And he was taken up into a cloud. Where he now sits at the right hand of God, being the high priest as our intercessor between us and God, continually praying and interceding for us. Scripture tells us, now I, I haven't checked it on my calendar, I don't know exactly when it is, but, but Scripture tells us that he's someday going to return, he's going to part the eastern sky, he's going to return and we're going to take us with him. And that we will live a life of no more. See, right now we live a life of some. We have to live with some, some darkness, some, some stickiness, some goofy situations. We have to live with some pain and some, some suffering. We have to live with some, some, some death and some tears and some pain and some crying and sickness. But he promises us that someday, if we stick with him, if we live that whatever happens existence, we will live in the land of no more. In the land of, uh, of no more tears, of no more pain, of no more sickness, where he's going to wipe our tears away, where there's, there's not going to be any more death, where there's only going to be celebrating and, and worship of God. I guess this all boils down to my question for us that I want you to think about for this entirety of the year. That I want, I, I want us to start this year on and live this year with in 2023. Are you willing to follow Jesus whatever happens? Wherever he leads? When, when, even when you don't have control and don't know where the next step is, are you willing to follow him regardless? For to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know what that means? If we follow Jesus, we never lose. We always win. He takes us from being a zero to being a hero. Are you willing to live a whatever happens existence? I've asked the worship team to come. And we, we sang a song last week, uh, Oh Lord, You Are Beautiful. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old 70s song for those of us who remember the 70s uh, clearly. Um, it was a song that, that Keith Green used to sing, and I remember listening to it in college. I wasn't in college in the 70s. I'm not that old, Josiah. Anyhow, um, but, as the song says, Lord, you are beautiful. Your face is all I see. And when your eyes are on this job, are, are you willing to live whatever happens this next year and give to God whatever is in your prison, whether that's your insecurities, whether it's your relationships, whether it's your finances, whether it's your boldness or lack thereof, you're willing to 
trust where you do not see where he's going. Because he's moving providentially in his world. Why don't you stand with us and, and as we sing this song, maybe, maybe you'd like to create an altar right where you're at or you'd like to come here and pray at an altar and say, God, I just want to give you whatever's in my prison because I know that whatever happens to lose Christ to die is gain. I want to live on whatever existence this next year. So let's sing together. As we sing, if you'd like to pray, we'd love to pray with you.
and be extenders of God's grace and peace to all those that you encounter. In fact, pray every morning, God, how can I be an extender of your grace and peace today? And keep your eyes open for opportunities. For you will impact and you will encounter and you will cross paths with people who need grace and peace. And the Holy Spirit will say, there's your person. Give them grace and peace. Give them grace and peace. Give them grace and peace. So today as you go, go in the grace and peace of God. And may God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace for whatever happens. Go in the grace of God. You are dismissed.